In this reflection, I would like to look at Robert Wright's book, The Moral Animal, and I'm especially interested in spending a little time with the main ideas introduced in chapters 1 and 2 of this book. The ideas concern natural selection and sexual selection. Let's see what Wright has to say about humans, the moral animal. Wright reminds us that William Paley argued in his 1802 publication, Natural Theology, that just as a watch implies a watchmaker, a world full of intricately designed organisms precisely suited to their tasks also implies a designer. He was right, of course. The question is whether this designer is a foreseeing god or an unconscious process. Charles Darwin, of course, argued for a meaningless process in his publication, Origin of Species, published in 1859. Wright tells us that Darwin once summed up natural selection in ten words. These ten words are these. Multiply, vary, let the strongest live, and the weakest die. The word fitness is a word not coined by Darwin, but one that he did accept. It is usually used in place of the strongest. Fitness is the thing that natural selection, in continually redesigning species, perpetually seeks to maximize. Fitness is what made us what we are today. And if this seems easy to believe, you aren't getting the picture. Wright writes, Your entire body was created by hundreds and thousands of incremental advances. Each increment was an accident. Each tiny step between your ancestral bacterium and you just happened to help some intermediate ancestor more profusely get its genes into the next generation. To sum up then, all Darwin's theory of natural selection is, says is this. If within a species there is variation among individuals in their hereditary traits, and if some of these traits are more conducive to survival and reproduction than others, then those traits will become more widespread in the population over time. The result is that the species aggregate pool of hereditary traits then changes over time. So natural selection is an inanimate process devoid of consciousness, yet is a tireless refiner and ingenious craftsman. Richard Dawkins would say that natural selection is the blind watchmaker. Wright tells us that it is fashionable in some circles to downplay the whole idea of adaptation of coherent evolutionary design. Popularizers of biological thought often emphasize not the role of fitness in evolutionary change, but the role of randomness and happenstance. For example, a climate shift uh, coming out of the blue to extinguish an unlucky species. And certainly this happens, and this is indeed one source of such randomness that greatly affects uh, evolution. And there are other sources as well. But uh, none of the randomness in natural selection should be allowed to obscure its central feature, and that is that the overriding criterion of organic design is fitness. With regard to natural selection, Wright would like to make a couple of points, and these are important ones. First, um, to say that something is a product of natural selection is not to say that it is unchangeable. Just about any manifestation of human nature can be changed, given an apt alteration of the environment. The second point Wright wants to make is to say that something is natural is not to say that it is good. There is no reason to adopt natural selection's values as our own. Wright wants to make another point, and this is a good one, and that is that Darwin divided survival and reproductive aspects of the process. Traits leading to the successful mating he attributed to sexual selection as distinct from natural selection. With regard to males and females, Wright notes that Darwin was wrong about sex. 
he wasn't wrong about the males being wooers. He saw that female reticence left males competing with one another for scarce reproductive opportunities, and this explained why males so often have built-in weapons, for example, the horns of stags horn-like mandibles and stag beetles, and the fierce canines of chimpanzees. What Darwin was wrong about was the evolutionary cause of female coyness and male eagerness. He saw this imbalance or asymmetry of interest that created a competition among males, but he didn't see what created the imbalance. Darwin's attempt late in life to explain the phenomenon of the sexual asymmetry was unsuccessful and in fairness to him write reports that whole generations of biologists could do no better. Today, however, there is a consensus uh, on the solution. The long failure to find it seems puzzling because in actuality it's, uh, the solution is very simple. Recall that natural selection doesn't consciously design organisms. It doesn't consciously do anything. It blindly preserves hereditary traits that happen to enhance survival and reproduction. Still, natural selection works as if it were consciously designing organisms. So pretending you're in charge of organism design is a legitimate way for evolutionists to figure out which tendencies evolution is likely to have ingrained in people and other animals. When playing the administrator of evolution, this thought experiment, and trying to maximize the genetic legacy, one quickly discovers that the goal implies different tendencies for men and for women. Men, for example, can reproduce hundreds of times a year, assuming they can persuade enough women to cooperate, and assuming there aren't any laws against polygamy which assuredly there weren't in the environment that our evolution took place many thousands of generations ago. Women, on the other hand, can't reproduce more often than once a year. This asymmetry lies partly in the high price of eggs compared to the rare, more minuscule, mass-produced sperm. In fact, this is biology's official um, definition of the female, the one that produces the larger sex cells. The point here is that each child, from a female's genetic point of view, is an extremely precious and valuable gene machine. Its ability to survive and then in turn reproduce its own young gene machines is of course of mammoth genetic importance. It makes Darwinian sense then for a woman to be selective about her partner the man who is going to help her build her gene machine. That said, a couple of points must be made, according to Wright. The first is that it's important to note that much of the relevant history of our species took place before our ancestors were smart enough to ask much of anything about why they selected the mates that they did and that even in the more recent past, after the arrival of language and a sense of self-awareness, there has been no reason for every evolved behavioral tendency to fall under conscious control. In fact, sometimes it is emphatically not in our genetic interest to be aware of exactly what we are doing or why from the perspective of natural selection. So then, a woman doesn't typically size up a man and think, um, he seems like a worthy contributor to my genetic legacy. She just sizes him up and feels attracted to him or doesn't. All the thinking has been done unconsciously, metaphorically, by natural selection. Understanding the often unconscious nature of genetic control is the first step toward understanding that in many realms, not just sex, we are all puppets.
and our best hope for even partial liberation is to try and decipher the logic of the puppeteer. Darwin's failure of understanding then was a failure to see what a deeply precious commodity females were. He saw that their coyness had made them precious, but he didn't see that they were inherently precious, precious by virtue of their biological role in reproduction. The first large-scale and clear step toward a human comprehension of this logic was made in 1948 by the British geneticist A.J. Bateman. And then in 1966, George Williams published his landmark work, Adaptation and Natural Selection, which laid down the fundamental insights that would support the edifices of work on the subject of friendship and sex. Then in 1972, Robert Trivers used the ideas of Bateman and Williams to create a full-blown theory that has ever since been shedding light on the psychology of men and women. By quantifying the asymmetrical imbalance of parental investment, it was E.O. Wilson's book on sociobiology published in 1975 and then Richard Dawkins book The Selfish Gene published in 1976 that gave Trivers work a large and diverse academic audience.